everybody, I'm Olivia, this is Abby, and welcome back to another episode of Quantum Crosstalk. We have a super interesting interview to share with all of you today with Ishmael Farrow, who is the Quantum VP of Data and Services. And today we talk to him all about uh, quantum and AI, specifically how the Cloud Transpiler service, which was announced back in December, which includes some AI transpiler passes. And we also dug in a little bit into the upcoming Qiskit Code Assistant as well. And make sure you stick around to the end. After our interview with Ismail, we're going to have some really important quantum announcements for you all. But we'll get right into it. Ismail, thank you so much for coming down and speaking with us. So maybe for some viewers who might not be familiar with your work, um, can you please tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to IBM Quantum and to become our VP of Quantum Services and Data? Oh, cool, yes. Uh, yeah, my background is uh, it's interesting because I am a very classical computer engineer. Okay, uh, My origin is classical computer uh, science engineer. And I work in different projects before to enter in research in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, when I joined in research, I had the opportunity to play with the different technologies. AI and quantum was one of them. And I helped from them to the rest of the quantum team to create all the software stack that is between the user okay, and the quantum computer. I helped to create all the cloud architecture around of all of our quantum uh, uh, platform. Uh, and after that, in 2016, I helped to, to create the uh, uh, IBM Quantum Experience. After that, Kiski, 2017. And with all these uh, achievements and all these software layers, one on top of another, at the end, we build these services. That is the thing that I try to lead in this moment. I try to help the team to continue to integrate all the quantum computation with classical computation and with the user. So I guess you must have taken a lot of your expertise from the classical software services exactly. sphere and applied that exactly. in quantum. Exactly. My, my big experience is to try to take difficult technologies or complex technologies and try to simplify as much as possible to make consumable for the users in different ways, no? because at the end we have different levels of users. We have users that try to learn quantum computation. The composer was one of the, the first yeah. iterations. Second, the people that try to continue to learn, but with more advanced, Kiski was one of the components that we realized and we create to, to, to cover that gap. And obviously, all the software that facilitate the users to have access to the quantum computer that we have at the beginning in the lab and now in our quantum data center. And I just want to emphasize for people, so you were really one of the driving forces behind putting the first device on yep. the cloud yep. back in 2016. Yep. That was, that, in part, that was you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. That really sort of, I guess, opened up this technology to pretty much everyone around the world. You yeah. don't have to be like physically located with these big yeah. machines to be able to use them. I, like that was, I think, revolutionary. To be honest, well, for me, I'm, my, I'm part of my team, the developers that try to like, take care about the put all the pieces on place on the cloud was a challenge because, again, we don't have any idea about quantum computing and about talking about circuits, gates, and at the beginning was, what is this? But at the end, it's like understanding what is the need from people, no? the, the researchers that try to make research in that time, no? focus more in the, in, the, in the qubits, in single qubits, thinking that the first computer was five qubits. And more the research was to, to find it's like all the uh, work in all, res all the research run of the qubits. The hardware is, was critical, no? But now with the years after, it's like the, we continue to add more layers, okay, to try to abstract all this complexity. And now it's more algorithms, more the utility scale. It's like try to figure out what is the next big steps. And thinking part of my day by day role continues to be the same. It's try to find what is the new features, try to understand how we can put this in the most efficient way in front of the users and all. So we've heard a few people say at this point that this is going to be the year of software at IBM Quantum. And a big part of that was the 1.0 release. But what are some other areas of the stack that your team is focusing on this year? Yeah. Uh, all my thing is focusing the services. Part of the, the concept is how Kiski is everything at the end. 
At, at the beginning, we create Kiski to put Kiski in the front of the user, like uh, the SDK to have access and interact with the hardware. But with the years adding more components in all the software stack that we have, we have ROM mitigation, primitives, we have the Kiski patterns, everything is Kiski at the end. It's like the user use the SDK, that is this 1.0 release, to develop the things in the laptop, but the rest of the layers that we have continues to use Kiski. We have Kiski on the cloud, we have Kiski near to the quantum computer to, example, to make error mitigation or trolling or other techniques to, to, to enhance the, the usage of the QPU. And from our side, the, our goal this year is like the, all the people understand that the Kiski is like a, all the concepts, all the software that we have and services. Kiski and, it all the way down. Exactly. <laughs> And, and it's clear for us that the SDK is, uh, from the user point of view, is something that they can touch every day because it's something that you install in your laptop. But also, it's like we want to highlight that the rest of the layers that we have in all of our cloud and HPC integrations or, or the, our data centers use Kiski also. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's something that um, we sort of we also uncovered a little bit when we were talking to Jesse in last month's uh, crosstalk is that how much of the the software stack kind of extends beyond just that SDK that yeah. you are downloading onto your laptop. Um, and so, yeah, I hope with the year of software, people become more yeah. aware of all the other yeah. software components that go into making yeah. quantum computing a reality. From one side, you know, part of the, the software stack that, that we use and our users use is focusing in how handle at the beginning is like the, the hardware, no? but now is how we can allow to the people to use more it's like from the algorithm point of view, how we can use in the most efficient way all these resources that is not only quantum that you need to use in the middle of all of your operations. No? Thinking that with the, this Kiski pattern that we announced in the last quantum summit that Again, it's a format that uh, we use to guide the users to say, okay, if you have a problem and if you want to translate the, your problem to quantum, you, need, you can use these four steps, simple steps. You can first map in your problem from classical to quantum. Second, you like try to optimize the okay. circuit that you generate, execute the circuit, and at the end get the, the post-processing. Thinking that Three of these steps is classical and is all this right. software stack that we have on your laptop, on the cloud, or near to the quantum computer. And again, and this is all when we talk about software is for that reason, no? because this year one of the big focus that we need to, to, to pay attention is more performance, more mod mod modularity. This means allow to the people to have more flexibility to take and change one component by for other component. Part of these uh, uh, Kiski patterns go in that direction because you have these small building blocks inside of the Kiski patterns that, example, you can use the transpiler that we can provide to you using Kiski, using heuristics, or you can use something new that we are working on that is this AI transpiler or other components that at the end you can replace one by another because it's modular to facilitate to different levels of users more flexibility and more like broad uh, capabilities or, or, or ways to do the same thing. You mentioned uh, the AI transpiler there, which brings us onto a next topic that I, I really want to dig into uh, with you today. And that is this idea of AI being such a huge topic right now in every corner of the software industry. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you see AI impacting or benefiting the, the kind of the quantum computing industry? Yeah, yeah it's like uh, there are in, in all this conversation between quantum and AI, there are two point of views. No? Uh, the one is the point of view that most of the people are thinking that is, oh, I, you have a quantum computer that is a new and novel uh, computational model, okay? How we can put machine learning there, okay? This is a big research area that is like are going to take time to continue to figure out new algorithms yeah. and most of these things. My team, and thanks, my team, <laughs> <laughs> try to cover the other area. That is how use the AI to improve the quantum mm -hmm. part, okay? In that area, we understand that, like I told before, no, it's like you have, you under, we understand that we have the quantum computer around of all of this classical computation. How we can put AI in these classical components mm -hmm. to improve the classical part, 
to at the end have advantage or, or have better results in the quantum computer. I think that's such an important um, kind of distinction because, you know, when I talk to people, everyone like is talking about AI and I feel like people generally tend to think only of how is quantum going to help AI yeah. and not the other the way, way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, yeah, our last or so the, the current thing that we are working uh, that demonstrate that it's very interesting. You use an experiment with AI to improve the quantum okay, uh, ecosystem is, is focused, for example, uh, how optimize the circuits or how uh, use the new generative models to teach people how develop and how learn. No? Because thinking that, uh, and we saw this in this way, you know, in some moment in the future, it's like the people are going to change from read static things to request, okay, bring me information about my the things that I have interest in this moment. I don't need to navigate for a lot of information. Bring me the information that I need to do the thing that I need to do. No? I'm thinking that that is interesting. And you mentioned how you can use the AI um, transpiler passes in the new cloud transpiler service yeah. that got launched. I think it was back in December yeah. or so. Yeah. Um, I know we have a, you know, the service is accessible now to our, our premium users. Yeah. Is that right? Um, just tell me about that. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> the, the idea started because uh, at the end, like we comment before, um, if uh, you have a problem, uh, the problem is, okay, uh, how you optimize something, uh, obviously, in optimization, there are a lot of uh, like ideas around that how you use machine learning to optimize things, no? because optimize things a lot of times mean how you detect a pattern, and in detecting the pattern, how you can make something, no? it's like detecting patterns. No? And transpilation is such a crucial part yeah. of the optimization yeah. process for quantum computing. If you're yeah. not transpiling your circuit well enough, that could be the difference between getting good results or well, getting yeah, from the heart exactly. total garbage. Yeah. Exactly, total garbage, yeah, exactly. In fact, uh, our keys kitting have a transpiler that have a lot of heuristics that have, if I remember well, more than 80, uh, 80 uh, different passes mm -hmm. to cover different aspects of the circuit. Uh, from my team, uh, we try to get this AI approach to say, okay, how we can use uh, AI and to be more precise. I don't want to be very technical, but we use something that, that uh, the, the technical people call reinforcement learning. The idea is how you can put uh, some problem in front of the model, the AI, the AI component, and the AI try to find the better path, mm -hmm. okay? Thinking that is the same approach that uh, a lot of people use to, for example, s uh, solve games or, or play games with AI. Yeah. It's like try to find it's like what is the best score yeah. all the time. Kind of like chess. Exactly. And the idea is how you can try to play a lot of times. You, we exactly yeah. work in this way. No? So you like different combinations. Different combinations. Exactly. That exactly. Gets you yeah. to the it reminds result. me of like when I'm playing chess on my phone yeah. versus like the AI computer and yeah. you can click like how hard you want the AI <laughs> computer exactly. to be. Exactly. You exactly. can choose how good you want your exactly. keys to be. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and the idea is with that is the, the concept is try to figure out paths. And with this path, the system, the model, okay, understand patterns. And say, oh, every time that I find this, the gates in this combination, I think that the best optimization is in this level mm -hmm. or in this way. Have machines training a lot of time, okay? Try, 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 and training and, and understanding what is the best options. And when you start to introduce that, you can see that the system discover new ways to, to, to solve patterns that from the human, obviously at the beginning is not clear, no? but mm -hmm. when you see the, 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 how the model, how the AI solve the problem, you say, oh, you see. And it's interesting because we have a strong relation between all, all of our 30 team in transpilation, this AI team, and the team that implement the heuristics. Why? Because at the end, all of them take advantage in each of these steps. Obviously, we take the, the theory people and the people that implement the heuristics to say, okay, is, that is our base mm -hmm. from AI. We put the AI and we say, okay, how we can get something better? If we get something better, we talk with the theory people and the theory people say, ah, you see, I go to challenge to you in the next level because I saw that if you put this and it's interesting because you use this to, again, reinforce the, yeah. the project. That is one of my favorite things about working at IBM Quantum is that we do have all these teams and yeah. it's, it's such an interdisciplinary 
atmosphere. So yeah, you can have the AI experts talk, talking to the quantum theorists, talking to the experimentalists, talking to the YouTube yeah, people, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, also the users. Um, is, that was what I was going to say. Yeah. I'm really excited about it from a user perspective yeah. because I feel like once it becomes, you know, really robust, this takes a lot of work yeah. away from a user who might be yeah. new to quantum computing and might yeah. know, you know, the secrets of transpilation. Yeah. I know the AI can produce some, some kind of improvements, but also some, some human need to, to try to uh, guide the what, what is the thing that you need to find because. Mm -hmm. The machines are machines. It's yeah. like, I mean, the machines are only as smart as the people programming. Exactly. To be clear. Exactly. Exactly. But exactly. the people programming them are pretty freaking smart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also want to talk a little bit about the other AI tool, yeah. which is the Code Assistant. Yeah. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, that is a, a work that we are doing in, in collaboration with other uh, departments in IBM, in this case, in IBM Research and, and Systems. That is uh, with one song X team, okay, and a new thing that uh, is working, a new tools that are emerging in this moment that are very interesting. That is Extract, Extract Lab, uh, and the idea here is uh, it's like the, the transpilation, but thinking more in the final user, no? How the user can learn or use in the most efficient way the quantum computers when write the code. Mm -hmm. So okay? it's kind of like an education tool. Exactly. Uh, it's a, a helper. A helper. Okay. Yeah, but, but yeah, it's like, you, you're right. It's like, at the end, it's like, if you don't know how to do that, you can write, how I can do blah, 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 in, in plain English. Mm -hmm. And after that, the system can bring to you a suggestion, a suggestion. So it's kind of like Stack Exchange, but yeah. it's in the exactly. Jupyter Notebook exactly. that you're exactly. typing in. Exactly. Because thinking that also, it's like, all the training, all the knowledge that, that we have in these models is based in all of our seven years of history of Kiski, all of our tutorials, everything that you and uh, us do with, uh, with Kiski. We have created a exactly. lot of code and a lot of content. Exactly, I was talking to some people about this yesterday actually and I was like, I wonder what data they're feeding it to like, yeah. learn off of. I yeah. hope it wasn't my first circuits that yeah. I started <laughs> Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, and I don't go to enter in a lot of technical details, but in fact, we uh, ponder, it's like we uh, put weight okay, in the different data. This means mm. legacy data is interesting to bring some basic things because at the end, circuit is circuits, gates are gates. But how you use the gates or how you use new features is something that is new. Yeah. The new things have more priority. Okay, We put more priority in the new things than in legacy things. That's so smart because, you know, I I still, you know, see old bits of code flying around with like really old versions of Kiskit yeah. that yeah. don't work anymore and yeah. then people wonder why it doesn't work. And so I, I think that's such an important part of it to make sure that, you know, Kiskit 1.0 is the version that yeah. people are, are getting the advice for. Yeah. So obviously this is a little bit more in the future, but maybe you can talk about how we think AI is going to influence the quantum software this year, and then how could it maybe in the future impact more scientific discoveries and increase the development of those? First, it's like the, the two concepts that we talk about, the, the transpiler service and the Kiski uh, code assistant, is something that we just have. No? Uh, we are working to put this more stable in front of the users. But uh, behind the scenes, we continue to add new things that is focusing the user experience. One example is like we have a small model that sample predicts the execution time of each job that you submit to our platform. And thanks to that, you have better prevision when, when you see how long they are going to take to be executed in the queue and on the queue views the, the, the jobs. All this is generated by AI in this moment. We have models that training with all the knowledge that we have, all the, 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 the usage, the metadata of this execution. And uh, we are going to continue to add these small components this year and the next years to facilitate the user experience. No? Something that we are going to release in these uh, weeks uh, uh, also is validation. It's like how you use also AI components to continue to validate and improve the user experience. When I say that is, if we, with the knowledge that we have, we can predict if one job are going to fail for A, B, or C reason, mm -hmm. okay, 
I go to tell you. In the same way that I can tell you that how you can optimize your code. That this is the next thing that we are going to do. It's like uh, thinking, connecting with the code assistant, if you have a piece of code, if I can highlight to you how you can improve your code, how can I explain to you why you can improve your code, that is this combination between code assistant, transp transpile as a service, and everything have AI behind, help to the user to understand and, and have better results. Because at the end, if you create better software, better code, uh, better circuits, you are going to have better results. And in all the components that we are going to have in the middle, again, facilitate to the users to continue to improve that. This is in the middle term. And the long term, obviously, uh, all these tools, this generative AI, all the people talk about the uh, chat GPTs or this kind of or Lama 3, this kind of model that is have more human compression, I go to say this in this way, and you can interact more like a human okay, with that. We thought or we tried to figure out is like what are going to be the next interfaces for the developers in the next generation of our software and our hardware. No? But from the software point of view, is how we are going to facilitate some tools to continue to extend the capabilities of the how you say, OK, I have this problem, you define the problem, and the system can provide to you some, like not final, but very, very fine uh, solution about the, okay, you can divide your problem in these four steps. In the first step, you need to do that. In the second step, the other and the other and the other. And connected with that, and thinking in our roadmap, in some moment, in two years from now, more or less, we need to use also AI to coordinate all the resources between classical and quantum. Uh, in that moment, it's like the complexity of the all the resources that you need to use are going to be more complex. Thinking, oh, you can figure out yeah. Some scenarios that we can use several quantum computers, okay, in the same time, right. and some of them with several uh, qubits, and all the classical preprocessing and the classical postprocessing. How you handle all of this? How you orchestrate that? So pretty much anywhere that classical software is supporting quantum computing is probably a space that where there is some potential for AI yeah. to yeah. to improve those yeah. those classical pieces. It's only going to get more complex, yeah, yeah. so it's important yeah. that we're looking into this now. Yeah, yeah, and thinking more and more in the future is uh, everything that is error mitigation and correction is something that again is uh, we uh, we we try to explore no? how we use AI to improve error mitigation and error correction techniques. Yeah. Well, that sounds insanely impactful. Sounds like your team has a lot of work to do yeah. <laughs> in the next few years. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and talking to us sure. about AI and all of these things, Ismail. This was super cool. Sure. What an amazing chat with Ishmael. I learned so much, and I'm really hyped now about all of the new AI and quantum possibilities. I know. I didn't even know half of the stuff that he was talking about today. His team is doing some really important work. We also are excited to announce the next edition of the Kiskit Global Summer School is coming and registration will be available and open very soon. So make sure you mark your calendars for July 15th through 26th. That's when the summer school is running this year. And check out the description linked below for any other information that you need to know about that. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next time.